Stephen Grantham, this one. Yep. In the address bar, just take over that and put blended all over the top of it. Yeah, click it once and it'll. Oh, I'm gonna click it twice. But over the top of everything. There you go, the first one in the history. So if you just open the program and jog my memory of what's going on now. Uh, next one is 210 to 250, uh, not that one, back one. Two ten to 250, web integrated teaching and learning. So we've just moved from distributed multi-site learning, which is another way of saying clinical schools network, to the web integrated learning. And the distinction here, uh, we, need, uh, we need Tracy Fortune. Uh, you're joining us in the, in the panel. Um, Anne, thank you, Anne. Uh, unfortunately, well, the topics are pretty good. And I'm representing dietetics in the Wiki Books thing. Do we have another free for this, please? Yeah. Uh, the distinction in this panel, web integrated learning, um, is that there is our learning management system, which by and large isn't web integrated. If you load a PDF and a handout to the LMS within the probe, then you're in more or less an intranet. Whereas the web, the World Wide Web, with social media and Wikipedia and, and all manner of different types of information and communication channels, bringing that in. So that's the distinction on this panel. We're talking about web integrated learning. How do we bring in the outside into our classrooms, or how do we take our classrooms out into the outside? So we have uh, Tracy and Anne from Occupational Therapy, who are just starting on this brave endeavor. And I'll be representing uh, Sharon and Adrian in dietetics, who have boldly taken their students out into the into the world wide web. Tracy, if you could, uh, you you are endeavouring embarking on a podcast production, uh, and from well, you, you tell us. Yeah. I won't try and summarise it. Okay. Um, look, we got a little bit of money to do a project. Um, we called it the Listen and Learn uh, OT podcast project, and it's both a upskilling and a resource development project in one. Really, um, at the upskilling part of it is, is basically so that a couple of us can learn about how do you make a podcast, how do you make the sort of resources that we can actually place on a website or in LMS uh, that might um, replace. Uh, people having to come in for lectures, and why do we want to do that? Um, the project at the moment sits inside a capstone subject called uh, Macro Strategies for Professional Practice, and the subject started in 2004, and one of the key learning experiences is that students do um, a collaborative project with an agency. Um, over 10 weeks. So they go out and they scope a project, some agency identified need. So it's a it's a, a subject, an academic subject that has a major work integrated learning component. Um, and early on in the piece, um, one of my colleagues said to me, look, you know, I can get projects up in Arnhem Land with such and such if, you know, it, will that be possible? How many, how many students do you think we could get up there? I said, well, we can't because they're coming in for lectures on Monday and Friday and doing their project in the middle. Um, so, you know, I just sort of let it go. And 2004 is a long time ago. We didn't think about any other way of doing things. Well, I didn't. It's about when Skype hit the scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then more recently, I had a student come to my office uh, this year saying, you know, for the project placement, we'd really like to go to um, Bangkok. Um, I know a charity where I'd, I'd like to do my project, and I said, oh. <laughs> again, that it sort of hit me that um, perhaps I really need to get the entire subject online, if you like, um, which means replacing um, two-hour lectures that, by and large, not all the students came to. Uh, 
you know, sometimes only half the students came to and they don't even necessarily uh, look at the Lectopia, the, the Echo 360. So um, there's lots of incentives to start looking at this didactic stuff that we were doing and just having more engaging ways of, um, I guess, presenting the subject. And I have in my mind this idea that, you know, we'll create, curate um, some sort of website, you know, where there will be, you know, uh, I wish Mary was here because her uh, orthoptics site on Wikiversity is sort of a real kind of inspiration where they can go, they, there's text that they can read, they can go to, um, you know, a YouTube, which might be me, introducing the subject for the year, that only might go for 15 minutes, not the whole full hour where they start falling asleep. And then there might be another 15 minute YouTube clip with something else. Um, <clears throat> so there's sort of learning how to make these small YouTube clips, um, which, you know, sounds like, well, that's all really easy. But for me, that's, you know, we're doing baby steps, I think. Um, but also to have, we, we also used to get in um, people from the profession to come and talk about current issues in occupational therapy. And we'd, we'd sort of have this panel going uh, and students would either come or they wouldn't. It would take lots of time, to all the sessional arrangements to get these people here, all the timing of it. And we couldn't necessarily control the message that they had and um, that they would give, even though it was a panel. That, um, so just start thinking about what are the different ways that we can get experts involved, uh, people from the profession involved in the subject and the idea of doing podcasts with people just sounded like, you know, a really logical thing to do. So then we had to learn, well, how do you interview people? Um, what's the equipment that you need? Um, and with Lee, we've been doing practice interviews on Google Hangouts. Um, so, you know, as, as you said, once you, if you do the web stream, then it goes to YouTube automatically, you've got it. Um, and I've got my first interview set up over in uh, Matt Smith's office, the Digital Services Manager. Yeah, Matt Smith manages the university's iTunes U program, so, and he is, uh, he is a producer in Radio National, so he has quite high-end skills and perspectives mm. on that. So as part of that project, he was quite, and, and you know, Lee was um, instrumental in setting up that relationship. Um, uh, he w has offered to, ha his space has all the kind of good audio sound stuff, so I will do the interview uh, in his space and he's offered to edit the first couple. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to have some audio editing training and through the project we've bought a little four track um, Zoom thing, uh, Zoom oh. recorders, um, where I would be able to go out or anyone in the department can go out and interview people. And so instead of having these big two-hour lectures, we have something much more interesting where they can go to a website, who knows where yet, but possibly just LMS for the time being, uh, where there might be four or five different things there, some YouTube clips, a podcast, mostly audio podcast, but, but maybe some Google Hangout, well, there'll be YouTube. Um, and it means that students can go somewhere else. They're not sort of tied to Melbourne. Um, I mean, obviously, we will still be having some face-to-face -face for particular workshops, but I think for the students who end up going overseas or interstate, we can, you know, if there are not lots of them, maybe we can do Google Hangouts for those um, and collaborate. It's a whole new, I don't know much about it. So, mm -hmm. so that's the project, really. Um, and it's, I'm sort of enjoying. So we're just starting out, uh, yeah. Tracy. Um, some of the, from memory going into it, some of the uh, topics that we had to think about was mm. where would we put this media mm. that we're producing so that people could get to it? Uh, and there was YouTube mentioned and Internet Archive and all of these external, <coughs> freely available, unlimited places that you can put media files. But then we confront the um, not overtly expressed issue of, yes, but that's outside La Trobe. Shouldn't, shouldn't we put it in the LMS? Shouldn't we put it in the LMS and thereby restrict access? Or shouldn't we put it on something else 
what is that something else? Do we even have something else? Um, and, and things like that. So we're still grappling yeah. with that. The other thing is DIY versus DIY production values versus professional production values. And that's where Matt Smith came in on the professional end of the scale. Mm -hmm. And I come in at the DIY lo-fi end of the scale, mm -hmm. using Hangouts as best to its potential mm -hmm. to get an audio file or to get a video file. Because mm -hmm. in my experience, every time I've asked for anything like an audio recorder or something like that, I get no. So mm -hmm. I just stay and don't ask and, and work out how to do it yeah. with my phone. <laughs> So we're grappling with that. Well, we're not grappling with that. You're going to go both ends of the spectrum mm. on that. You're going to do a bit of DIY and a bit of high end. Yeah. And at the end of the project, we'll probably hear from mm. you about what you thought was yeah. sustainable. And I think the Google, hang Google Hangouts to do an interview is fantastic because they don't have to come into the studio here. Um, I don't have to go anywhere with, with the new recorder, but at least we've got it there and we've got different modes of doing it. Mm -hmm. The other part of the project was, as I said, to purchase, um, we've got the the Zoom 4-track, which is a slightly more upmarket Audio. digital recorder. Um, we've got some little ones too, um, and we purchased just some lapel mics, and really I want to encourage everyone in our department to, when they go into a lecture, just record yourself. Um, I mean, we had troubles last week with um, things not working in Echo 360, and uh, you sort of lost that, but if people can just get into the habit of recording their own lectures or if we have guests coming, you know, we had an example of somebody coming from Britain um, uh, to talk about her research. There was a, a bit of a stuff up with the invitations being sent. Four people came to that session and it wasn't recorded in any way, shape or form. But if we made it practice that, you know, we've got the recorder, we've got the lapel mic on the person, We've got an instant podcast, obviously, as long as they agree. So another little part of the project was um, building up resources that could be used on an occupational therapy website that showcased the work of staff um, and any guest speakers that came. Um, sort of like the sports... Um, I can't remember his name now. Ed. Sports Ed. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that sort of vision would be fantastic for us, um, but we're probably, you know, just too far down the track at the moment. Yeah, and it touches again the DIY versus professional. I mean, mm -hmm. if we class the special device, the audio recorder, even though it's only a hundred and something dollars, plus yeah. the lapel, which is two hundred and something dollars, it's a special device that you have to remember to keep charged and bring. Mm -hmm. and, and the DIY is, there's something that I've always got with me, it's not always charged, but it's my phone, and it has a pretty good audio recorder on it, and I have usually a being a male, have a top pocket, and I can just drop that in there, and that's how I record any presentations I'm giving, and it's good enough, and then it just goes up. Well, I mean, Matt Smith also said that that was a very good way of doing things, and, and staff should be, should do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So Anne, you're you're coming out of a um, a project that you ran this semester, running the university system called Pebble Pad. Yeah. which is basically a system that does two things. It, it, it offers a platform for students to produce a, a website of sorts, but it also offers an opportunity for people who are tasked with assessing competencies that they can go to that part of it and a student can put their media of evidence that they have demonstrating competency or proficiency in something and the assessor can just navigate that list of competencies and check off with the the evidence. So there's two parts to Pebblepad. Anne's group have been mostly using the web site side of things. Could you tell us more about that and how it's gone? Um, yes, yeah, so we, it's been across the whole year actually and it, and, uh, it came out of a sense in OT and I guess it fits with Tracy's project too that we uh, as a group of academics really needed to get on board with web-based technologies and start thinking about how we could use them in our teaching for a whole variety of reasons. Um, we decided to use PebblePad for a whole range of reasons, but um, one of them being that our students now graduate have to be registered, and when once you're registered you have to um, show your ongoing professional development, and so we thought that PebblePad was, at being the online, online portfolio, gave students the opportunities to start thinking about how they would collect evidence about their learning. Um, 
We also used it because it enabled some collaboration between students and um, the opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer plus staff to student feedback on what they were creating. Um, so across the year they've done four different learning activities and or assignments which we've assessed but not competency based assessment, more your typical academic assessment. And quite often they've handed in something in a more traditional assignment form but there's it's been complemented by and the, something that they've done in Pebblepad. A, 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 I guess one of the really key things for me about Pebblepad and, and just thinking about web-based learning was also the fact that um, we, we use web-based learning and very much the notion that students are involved in creating knowledge and so we wanted to give another way of uh, students actually being able to share the knowledge that they've created. So in a couple of assignments what they've done is create a resource uh, in Pebblepad that is available to the whole cohort and um, they actually haven't had a lot of opportunity to use those this year but next year when they go on placement, um, Pebble, the students have access to Pebblepad throughout their studies here and for a year afterwards. So these resources they will actually have access to for all of that time. So we're hoping that next year when they're on placement, for instance, one is a, uh, a whole, each student has contributed a critique of a community resource that you might like to link a client to in occupational therapy. So uh, we've got 170 students on two campuses, so that means a resource of 170 different organisations that they could, when they're on placement and they say, I've got a client that with these needs, they could look up and choose from um, these resources. Um, so I think some of the challenges have been that uh, we didn't really realise uh, the difficulty that students would, our students apart from the Bendigo students were all new to Pebblepad and so were we as staff. Um, it's actually, I think students needed more support than we gave them to learn how to use it and we needed to give them more explanation about why we were using pebble pad some of them just they found it difficult and some of, some of them just saw it as an irritant and so why do I have to use pebble pad when I could have just submitted this through LMS mm. um, we actually did do a survey a, form, a formal survey and got some feedback from so I'm basing that on this formal survey um, I think even for staff a number of staff were, were involved so that was really terrific uh, Terry Young here at the university has been incredibly supportive and very helpful so that was another reason for choosing Pebblepad because we thought we'd better go with something where we can get some support. But at the end of the day I think there's some issues that we're now grappling with and that they include is Pebblepad really the resource, the right resource. The students in the survey told us that they all use Facebook. We know that they've got an informal Facebook group outside of us that they do a lot of sharing of resources and materials on. We know that they use YouTube often um, for instance in our problem based learning tutor tutorials they'll come back and share something they've found on YouTube. So to a certain extent there's a sense of why are we introducing another system that is closed within Latrobe when perhaps we should be going to something that is transferable beyond Latrobe and also that they already know how to use. And the other thing about this whole project, I think, is that, okay, we've learned a lot about Pebblepad, but we actually haven't learned anything about Wikiversity or Google Hangouts or all those other potential resources. So there's a feeling amongst some of us that perhaps the next stage is for, for those who feel interested to get involved in experimenting with some of those things at a personal, professional level. Because um, my current theory is if I can kind of start using those things for myself, that's going to be a much more helpful way for me to be able to use them in my teaching rather than try to kind of spend a whole year learning one system. So, yeah, that's probably yeah, it. That's bang on, Anne. And you finished there where I hope you're going to go into the possible research projects we might work yeah. on that, that does the basic, basic yeah, so for that, some sort of action research project. So, we've had some discussions with Lee initially about yeah, an action research project and writing up some case studies and 
yes, about how these uh, web tools might be useful for professional academic work and then transferable into teaching and hopefully transferable for students beyond their life as a student of the trade would be the investigation there. So if anyone else would like to join us in the first stage of how do we use these popular tools in our professional capacity before we then go on to imagining it and how we might use it in our teaching work, which is part of our professional capacity, but I mean actually rolling it out with students and stuff. I'm here to talk about, with whatever time is available, leaving enough time for questions, um, Sharon and Adrian in dietetics, as well as Mary, have used um, probably more, more in tune with this panel. They've used the um, web, particularly the two very big platforms, YouTube and Wikibooks, which is a subsidiary of Wikipedia, which is obviously a, a very huge project. Um, in terms of YouTube, Mary replaced her lectures with YouTube um, by using the feature called YouTube Playlist. You create an account in YouTube, you use the advanced search features in YouTube, it's called a filter, uh, to target what you're looking for in content, and when you find content, you add to playlist, which is a little drop down below each video, assuming you're signed in. And you can create, as far as I know, infinite number of playlists, and so she created a playlist for every, what would have been her lectures. Um, <clears throat> after the playlist was created, she found that thanks to the quality of content she was finding, she was able to replace a one hour lecture down to about six to seven minutes of high impact content. Um, then there is a feature when you edit your playlist, you can insert your own webcam video between each or some of those videos. And that's how she addressed the issue of continuity, because obviously the audio levels and the quality of video that she's sampling in that playlist varies. So her face appearing between each clip or each second clip offers some sort of continuity. And once that playlist is created, it's then very easy to display that in her learning management system if she's using that. In fact, she's using Wikiversity to compile her subject to be. Um, with Adrian and, um, and Sharon, they were tasked with de developing their subject so that it could be more effective in the clinical skills network uh, or the multi-site learning. And, uh, and to approach this at first pass, they changed one of their assessments, which doesn't really address the thing that's the challenge. But what they asked their students to do is to change their writing assignments to be a, uh, you've probably heard this before, a lot of you have heard this before, to be a chapter in a would-be textbook in Wikibooks. They took that one on. What did, was different, though, is it's little, lots of little one-page flyers, educational flyers, for a target community group who they would think needs a nutritional intervention of some sort. So a group like, I don't know, international students who don't know how shopping centers work in this area, and they're going to places and they're getting a limited a range of familiar food and therefore getting a you know, nutritional, uh, not, not great nutritional intake. So if that was a community group that that student identified with, their job is to understand the community group, go and speak to them, and come up with a little one-page flyer, and then conduct an educational session with them. And as a result, then your wiki book, which is due, in fact, in about an hour from now, their wiki book chapter, uh, is, is there's about 23 or 25, maybe more, I haven't looked recently, of these flyers for different types of target groups uh, with information for them. I think they're going to go on with other subjects where they repeat that process using Wikibooks um, as a platform for student-generated content. Is that, that term I just used is put that into Google and you'll find the UK universities are going bananas over this student-generated or user-generated approach to, um, to content. Uh, so that's largely what they've been doing in terms of web integrated learning. Is there any uh, questions, or is anybody else in the room working in this space more squarely? Or I just had a question, and I guess it deals with why Mary chose Wikipedia over our limits, and you perhaps can't answer that. But what would be the advantages of using Wikipedia over? Okay. Limits? So, um, just to clarify, Mary's using Wikiversity. Wikiversity, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Which is close enough. Uh, Wikipedia is the most well-known reference text project under the umbrella of the Wikimedia Foundation, which Wikibooks and Wikiversity and Wikivoyage and Wikispecies 
a whole range of reference text projects work under. And by the namesake, Wikiversity obviously is about uh, educational material and stuff. I think Mary was attracted to the idea of making her coursework widely known, uh, her subject widely known and, and accessible, both in terms of a principled approach but also a practical approach. I think from past experience she had some trouble with students who did not yet have their username and password or weren't familiar with navigating the LMS. So just having a link that you can email to someone and they're on the page looking at this thing addresses that in practical terms. But it's also a developmental space. So I help her, I can help her, anyone can help her author her handouts and whatever else in that space. And then when it's finished, or when she's ready to pass it into the LMS, she can put a copy in the LMS quickly, very quickly and easy. Uh, and if the LMS fails, she can come back to the Wikiversity. If the Wikiversity fails, not that it would, uh, it goes back to the LMS. So I hope that answers your question. I think that's yeah, why that's she's doing it. Okay, okay. thank you. Question about wiki books and student contributions. Um, I guess they're available to Everyone. the public. Yeah. So, is do we have a duty of care then, potentially to patients, of um, those students who might not be very capable, mm -hmm. putting information out there that might be misleading and potentially even dangerous? Well, in the, in the field, of, uh, their, their subjects and their topics that they're taking on, I think the risks are fairly low. We did talk about this to some degree, uh, to quite a large degree actually, when they had, they had never considered this and, did, and when they were confronted with it, still considered it in their field to be of no risk with third year students that they're working with. Um, they also subscribe to the idea that not engaging in this space is absence of duty of care. That's you know, I obviously plant that seed and, and they subscribe to that idea. Uh, so there is a range of content on there of questionable accuracy and value written by other volunteers. Uh, they have quite a large human capital at their disposal, the students, and they're able to coerce into these types of um, production of media uh, that after assessment can be said to be what is accurate or not. And after assessment they can say this is not accurate below the line, this is very good above the line. And so all of those disclosures are, this is student work in progress due at this date. We will then separate after assessment what is good and what is bad. All of that's written on the site. On top of that, obviously these platforms, YouTube, Wikiversity, and Wikipedia, have their own disclosures saying this is user generated content, use at your own risk and all that sort of stuff. Um, I should mention though, in dietetics, it's very interesting because that's the first subject where I put myself out there as the go-to help person to support them in their, in their work. Uh, they didn't uh, take my advice of scheduling tutorials, regular tutorial times to progress their work and understand the platform. That then elevates the risk considerably, um, in my view. And as a result, most of the work is being done today, due today. So the wiki book just sat there empty, and um, there was no help in managing their time and progressing the work. What I've been able to observe in my role as the, the help, one of the help people, is that the group, as I knew it would be, polarised. There are those who say, why are we doing this? Can I just use elements and want to fly under the radar, basically? And then there are those who are really turned on by their work going out in the open. And now they start taking, and they've said it to me, they're taking um, their online identity quite seriously now because Google search lands on their name because they've chosen to use their real name and, and all of that sort of stuff. And you get shows in their work. They're showing a lot of pride and a lot of flair. So I would say, if you had, generally speaking, from my experience and in this experience, if you had 15 or whatever, I'm just 15 because it breaks into thirds easily. The polarization is one third are, are very much turned on to the thing, one third are neither here nor there about it, and one third are very much um, outspokenly um, adverse to the to the thing. So one of the things going into that, knowing that, is we coach them in how to go into this project with an alias and how to hide your identity and all of that sort of stuff if you wanted to. Not that they would have probably paid much attention or, or that. It's only now that their work is due are they confronting these things. But it also, interestingly, yesterday, without naming anyone, of course, um, it exposed a third year student who, at least one that I know of, who admitted she has no computing skills whatsoever and that her brother has basically got her through all of her assignments and this is the first one 
she felt that has really challenged her. She's very pissed off about it because she thinks it's, you know, I have to do all this extra work all of a sudden. But she's also quite proud of herself and what she's able to achieve, what her feedback will look like at the end. You know, I'd say with Pebble Pad over the course of the years, you know, this, I'd agree with that by thirds. And I'd say the third who have embraced it have shown by the end that they can really use it well mm. and be very creative with it. And in, we, the last thing we got them to do was upload a, an audio recording of a reflection on their, what they've learned through the problem-based learning process over the year. And um, I mean, you, and we did make it optional because they didn't like Pebble Pad. So we said you can, we want an audio, but you can just email it to us if you want. So even just doing things like that, I think, has was um, has opened our uh, just yeah just straight away you see the benefits of like Tracy was saying before the podcast just different ways of doing things. None of my students wanted to use to upload anything to Pebble Pad. Uh, many of them said, "Why can't we just send you a written document of our reflection?" And I said, "No. Some of your reflections are about your communication. I'd like to hear you reflect." And they all rose to the challenge. They all sent, you know, MP3 files through, and I was listening to them. And I think, actually, in retrospect, having done it, they really enjoyed doing it. So yeah. we did things like ask them to reflect on how they would use what they learned this year, next year, and as a future practitioner, and what advice would they give to a, early, a first year student. So I mean, our idea behind that was that, with their permission, we might be able to save some of those audio files and use them with the incoming students. Question for Catherine? Yeah, I'm just wondering with those thirds, speaking as a you know, got in all blood eye myself, um, I'm dry kicking and screaming to every new bit of technology, which is not to say I won't consider it. Um, but do you think with those thirds there might be an age component or a, uh, you know, because I know my children, you know, it's, like it's just sort of like teaching and breathing. It's, it's just something that you do. It's not a, there's no sort of in the same um, way? Do you think it might be? I, don't, I mean, you two might have a different opinion. For our group of students, uh, the ones who responded to our questionnaire, uh, we have mostly female students, so I couldn't say the difference between male and female. But I would say no, it's, it's not an age thing. They all, we, they all said they have no trouble accessing the internet whenever they want. Most of them are in the process of using at least a phone or an iPad is in addition to a computer. So we've also we're trying to design things that are accessible on any device. Um, I, I, look, my gut feeling is it's more to do with your whole approach to study and how much time you feel co committed to putting in. As, as, yeah. as my, my observation goes uh, mostly not with students, it's with staff and, and stuff like that. And uh, I don't. I don't observe that age thing. In fact, some of the most progressive people. That excuse oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's perhaps true that, they, that the, the elder people may not have intuition for computing, but they have some sort of um, social disposition or, or an out, philosophical outlook mm. that drives them to it. And I think I've observed the same in students. Um, Actually, so that I think no technology is apolitical. It is political, and uh, and the way I approach technology is definitely political, which attracts and polarizes a group. Uh, Sue and, and I have a really quick question, and I'm a little embarrassed to ask it in one step. So, given that we are trying to get more online and I hear Tracy talk about podcasts and Liz spoke about going to specialists and getting snippets of film and whatnot. When we have a lecturer who comes in, a specialist lecturer, we pay them a fee. Mm. And now with this material, it can be ongoing, assuming that the theory doesn't change or whatever it is they're talking about is current. So theoretically, when somebody does something for a class we could use it almost ad infinitum. What is the university's policy on paying for something, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the university has a, a number of policies, in fact, far too many. Uh, 
the one that governs this, I would say, primarily is the intellectual property policy. And the last time I looked at that, and though I understand that it's under review at the moment, or has been for some time, the last time I looked at that, it has a critical paragraph in there encouraging teachers to publish their material. So I can't quite quote it exactly, but it is, it is that, no, no ifs or buts about it. That doesn't quite answer your question about paying externals coming in and the and so tracing. Extra, I'm really asking. Do we have to pay them an extra component because it could be repeated? Yeah. We are getting sometimes, because we have a lot of sessional lecturers coming in, and there are people coming in now who are saying, I don't want this to be recorded, and I won't give you a copy of my PowerPoint yes, slides to give to release to students. So we just had a discussion about that the other day. So. Do you say, okay, so this is a special guest presentation and because if it's a lecture, we, we so we say to that person, yes, sure, we'll have you come but we'll, and we still pay them the same rate, but it's a guest presentation as opposed to in the kind of normal lecture stream. I, I mean, this, this was just a discussion that we were having about how well, to deal with it. I would say one, I think it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I wonder, because Nick Stone, is, uh, he's, he came across an interesting um, Thing. He was trying to connect with uh, Indigenous community groups locally and was using open platforms with diversity and YouTube, particularly copyright licenses that enable free reuse. Mm -hmm. And according to Nick, when that was explained to the community group, that allayed their fears or removed their fears or concerns that the university was getting something out of them and was going to profit from it. Oh, look, I totally, no, I totally understand that. I can just imagine if you real so-called specialists who we might use who would say, and they often don't mind the lecture being put up on Echo or whatever. But when it goes public. Yeah. But yes, or when we use it. they're no longer going to need to do that and we reuse it. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. So I the can issue. imagine a couple will say, well, you can pay me for three years. Yeah, that's the issue. A lot of those people come in and repeat the same thing year yeah. after year. Yeah. Yeah. They get the fee. Yeah. 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 And while they're potentially saying by the use of these technologies, you potentially we do it once and pay you once mm. and then use it for a long time. So the university isn't necessarily profiting from it, but they're well, not, they're they're not they're either they're able either. to profit from their intellectual property, I suppose. But if the question is, is it their intellectual property or the university's once we've paid them for a lecture? I think mean, morally it's their intellectual it's property. Their property. They, they, yes, if they come under some contract that explicitly says that this, this is the, um, the property of the university, then that's, well, why did they sign that contract? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Should talk about our release form. Uh, yeah, release, <laughs> release form. Tracy dealt with this I issue mean, somewhere. All those questions are the same. I mean, you know, if I do away with someone coming in, doing a lecture and paying them, I don't know, 200 whatever dollars, um, now I'm approaching people who I know and think will, well, I, I think that they will want to talk about the particular topic. And it's really, you know, it'll get edited down to 10 minutes probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, Lee and I, and Carol McKinstry, who's also working on the project, sat down and worked up a release form that kind of makes it very clear that this, you know, don't talk about things that might be detrimental to your organisation, that this is going to have a Creative Commons licence. Um, it's going to be our property, your property, everybody's property. Basically, well, and if they don't want to do it, then you've got to go to someone else. Are you going to pay people for it? Uh, for the project, we um, have a an inconvenience fee, um, <laughs> good, that's good. and it's uh, nominally the three one two zero code, which is repeat lecture. So it's really just a one -off a one one off payment. But I think that you know the people that we talk to on Google Hangouts potentially we won't do that because. You know, the inconvenience is coming into the university from wherever they are. Um, you know, a lot of the work is me working up the questions and the preamble and, and all the rest of it. I mean, that, you know, yes, it's something they're an expert in. Um, I don't know. These are all really well, tricky once questions. Again, once again, it's, it's somewhat political. Um, mm. Different fields are competitive, more competitive than others. Different fields are believe strongly in their social group. And so, therefore, want to get it out there. So, well, it's becoming more political because we're getting more courses of 
offering the same thing, so we want to say, you know, we have access to certain specialists here or whatever, you know. Yeah, I can totally understand and receive this thing. Mm. Well, just with the um, website that we did, we went in out into the field and did some of those inventory cases, so it's a little bit different than what we do in the specialist lecture. But we didn't pay them, we got them to sign a model release form to say that we could use the material in the image. And we we have their um, organisation branding running through video. So in some ways, the fact that they get the image, yeah, they get the, you know, the St John of God, it's got the St John of God details on there as well. And they were happy with that, but again, not a specialist from the image to the research Yeah. Seems to work well. I'm not sure, has anybody got the schedule in front of them, what time we're meant to finish this panel? Yeah, it's 2.50. 2.50, yeah, and we're 10 minutes over. So we, we, we should have a cup of tea. Have yeah. a cup of tea. And and walk then around. The next session is producing educational media. Uh, so the ins and outs and costs of that. Uh, let's have a quick tea break and come um, back in about two minutes. Could people just sign in so we